Half a day. My name is Dawn Lees Regis, and welcome to my presentation, Symbols and Images of the Feminine. This project encompasses eight separate presentations designed to share with the viewer how women have been represented in art through the ages. They are Goddess, Temptress, Flora, Fauna, and Food, Idyllic and Fragile, Death and Martyrdom, Lust and Voyeurism, Pinned Up, Pinned Down and Pain, and Vagina Dentata and the Fear of the Feminine. Why, you might ask, should we care about how women's images are portrayed in art? Because seeing is believing. We believe what we can be based on what we see. We define our lives around what we see and hear. We dream and imagine and make plans based on the examples that we're presented with. And we must pay attention to what we feed our souls through our eyes and our ears. Artists create from their own level of understanding. They imbue their work with their life circumstances, with their fears and concerns, and with their own specific experiences. In each presentation, I will share some images, give you a little background on the work, and tell some stories where it seems important. And I'll do my best to present without too much judgment. And so, let's begin. I will warn you in advance that there are some pretty difficult images to look at in this presentation that are beyond the basic nudity often found in art and probably not appropriate for people under 16. This presentation will survey some common male fantasies about lust and voyeurism and some feminist responses. The myth of Persephone's abduction by Hades is linked with sexual predation and seasonal change. In this painting, Persephone, alone and naked, is sleeping after a picnic beneath a great oak. There is a tension of anticipation as the man in the painting gazes upon Persephone. His hand seems to reach out to try and touch her hip. Painting Persephone as a mature woman, less viciously posed like a luscious pinup model that once adorned calendars in men's barbershops and garages, Thomas Hart Benton indicates that Persephone is not an innocent maiden perhaps suggesting insight into the artist's feeling about women and his sexuality. Susanna is usually presented as unaware of the elders' presence or even welcoming them in a flirtatious fashion. Gentileschi, on the other hand, shows Susanna's distress at being watched and accosted by the men, presenting the incident as a traumatic event. Although the work shows the clear influence of her father stylistically, the subject matter is more dramatic and expressive than his. The dream shows the 50-year-old Picasso's 22-year-old mistress, Marie Therese Walter, in erotic reverie. Half her head appears to be a penis. Her hands form a vagina. It's a primal painting and a blissful one, with its simplified forms, lush colors, and dancing patterns. It is said that this painting was part of a collection, each piece completed in a matter of hours. Picasso, in competition with Matisse, was churning out these sexually charged paintings to pull together a retrospective. This may be a difficult section for some to look at, but the claim that pornography is art is reason enough to present these fantasies of women's sexual desires. This is an illustration for a book published in 1926. The book review on Amazon says this. If it was Pierre Louis' intention to emulate the libertine works of the Marquise du Sade with this unbelievably salacious tale, then he certainly succeeded. Following the exploits of our young narrator as he conquers one young lady only to be introduced to her two sisters and debauched mother. We learn of how Rosette, Charlotte, and Lily came to be prostituted by their mother, the manner of their training, and their numerous physical encounters. Now it is second nature to the trio to satisfy themselves in all manner of libidinous deed and device without restraint or modesty. Henri Toulouse-Lautrec frequented prostitutes and was fascinated by their lifestyle and the lifestyle of the urban underclass and incorporated these characters into his paintings. Physically disabled and disfigured himself, he found an affinity between his condition and the moral penury of the prostitute. He created about 150 drawings and paintings inspired by the life of these women. He declared, 
A model is always a stuffed doll, but these women are alive. They stretch out on the sofas like animals. They make no demands, and they are not in the least bit conceited. Nowhere else do I feel so much at home. Here we see a young woman cleaning herself with obvious sexual overtones. With respect to eroticism, Leonor Fini often spoke of the need for a sense of decorum that balanced what was experienced with what was felt. She said, the decorum must be right. It will be if it supports the eroticism. If one experiences this sensation, that proves that it is correctly carrying out its connecting role. This is a portrait of Marie-Louise O'Murphy, the 15-year-old lover of Louis XV. As this is a Rococo painting, it follows that Boucher's pink bottom nudes are all about crude pleasure without consequences, nudity without modesty, desire without boundaries, and in my mind, sets the stage for modern living. This work, representing the allegory of marriage, was commissioned by the Duke of Urbino and given as a gift to his young wife. Its purpose was as a teaching tool. The evident eroticism of the painting was used to remind the woman of the marital obligations she would have to fulfill to her husband. Venus, the goddess of love, is shown as a sensual and delectable woman staring at the viewer who could not ignore her beauty. The dog at the feet of the woman is the symbol of marital fidelity, while in the background, the housemaid looking down at the young girl as she rummages in a chest symbolizes motherhood. Rene Magritte is considered a surrealist by art historians, but according to the Surrealist Manifesto, elements in art should not be related in order to be surreal. However, elements in this painting are definitely related, unless you consider what is meant to be seen and what is not. Surrealists were influenced by the teachings of Freud who define the uncanny as that class of the terrifying which leads back to something long known to us, once very familiar. Magritte does just that in this work. A nightdress and a pair of shoes should be comforting and familiar, but because he imbues each item with human elements, they become terrifying. The inference is that women are terrifying. In this painting, Picasso presents an angular, abstract, and voyeuristic view into a bedroom. This painting is my interpretation of the Chamorro legend of the Fragrant Lady, which is a story about Pedro, who has tendencies as a lazy boy. One day, while snoozing in the shade, he was woken suddenly by a strong scent of sweet lemon. He followed the scent, but soon lost the trail. Day after day, this scenario replayed itself, and each day Pedro was lured a little further into the jungle. One day he made it all the way to a quiet pond surrounded by beautiful plants and trees. The scent of sweet lemons was so strong, Pedro nearly passed out. But just before that happened, he noticed lemons that seemed to be jumping up out of the pond and sliding down again back into the water. As he watched more intently, he began to make out the figure of a woman and was completely entranced. The specter was a Tantamona who upon discovering that she was being watched during her private bath became enraged and Pedro was never seen again. The female nude was a very common subject for Valaton. His journal records about 500 paintings in this genre. In the white and black, the emphasis is on the model's pale skin. He does this by minimalizing the decor and using complementary colors on the black woman. There is no effort to make the models romantic or beautiful. The sexual tension in this work is accomplished by the black woman, arms folded in her lap, the cigarette cocked between her lips, its blunt ember edging dangerously close to all that exposed white flesh that could so easily be violated. The gaze in this painting is shifted from the white bourgeois European male, for whom this painting was likely created, to a minority ethnic woman who is seen to be consuming all the visual pleasures that the privileged male archetype feels entitled to. Embedded in this composition is an orientalist fear and desire for interracial and same-sex erotic fantasy. 
A recent article written by Jackie Palumbo for CNN Edition tells us that over a century ago, Suzanne Valadon began painting lively portraits of sensual and self-assured women with full curvy bodies, often nude and with pubic hair. Occasionally, she painted nude men as well, bucking art historical tradition and presenting them as figures of desire. Her canvases were full of bold outlines, vibrant colors, and loose brushwork, and she deftly illustrated her subjects' interior lives rather than the idealized scenes of leisure so prevalent at the time. She was a single mother. She scandalously kept a younger lover. She dealt with her son's addiction to alcohol. Her son just so happens to be the artist Maurice Utrillo. Her first big job at the age of 15 was as a trapeze artist with a circus, and, but she stopped after a fall and a severe back injury. While recovering, she began to model for artists, which was tantamount to being a sex worker at the time, and began to draw on her own. She listened to the instructors while she was modeling and applied their suggestions to her own work. Edgar Degas became her mentor and helped her show her work at the Salon des Beaux-Arts in 1894. Since she was considered low class and had no formal training, the fact that she was a woman artist was purposefully hidden. She was listed simply as Valadon S in the catalog. And we end with Jenny Seville's Propped a superlative self-portrait that shatters canonized representations of female beauty. Seville is a contemporary British painter and is known for her large-scale painted depictions of nude women. The primary subject of all of Seville's early works is the artist herself, and has almost exclusively painted female subjects throughout her career. In doing so, she has sought to interrogate prescribed notions of beauty, specifically a cultural aversion to corpulence. Recalling the influence of a host of art historical masters, from Rubens to Rembrandt to Willem de Kooning and Lucian Freud, Seville inserts herself into the tradition of the female nude, distorting and inverting this relentlessly male convention. Thank you for joining me today. My one big hope is that from this presentation, you begin to see things through a more enlightened position that you begin to look at images presented to you with a curious and open mind, and perhaps develop a healthy recognition that you don't have to absorb images as your own truth. You and you alone are responsible for your own truth.